Hi, I'm Dave Waddell with the King County Hazardous Waste Management Program. And in this portion of our training video, we're going to talk about chemical storage. So in the room we have here, you can see that there's a large number of chemicals up on the shelves. And what I'm hoping we'll be able to do is explain to you a simple way to segregate your chemicals so incompatible chemicals are not stored together. And in the case of an earthquake or uh, somebody moving a bottle a little too quickly, we don't start off a chemical reaction that could create a real hazard to your health and uh, possibly to uh, the room that you're in, uh, fires or other chemical reactions. So how do we safely store chemicals in schools? Well, first you have to figure out what chemicals you've got in your school, and this requires a lot of snooping around. So you look in the stock rooms. You look in the cabinets. You look on the shelves. You look in the fume hoods, and you look under the fume hoods. You have to check all the drawers. You have to look in boxes. You go to the refrigerators and open them up and see if there's anything in there, especially the ones in the laboratory. Check the freezer, but you also need to check the one in the break room. Quite often teachers have a secret stash of chemicals they'll tuck, tuck back there. You check by the sink, you check under the sink. You check on the carts, you check on the benches, you look on the walls. Here's one that we found that had the periodic table of the elements with the chemicals themselves and a beautiful wall mounted display that you can buy commercially. Every hazard characteristic you can imagine, all carefully collected next to each other. On tables, sometimes we find boxes that have the entire periodic table that they haven't gotten around to putting up on the wall yet, so they just spread them out on the table. We also look in the bus maintenance barns. In the bookcases, here's some potassium cyanide we found five feet away from students in the back of the classroom. We look high, we look low, we check the windows. Never know when they're going to use a flammable can of paint thinner to uh, prop the window open. We visit the maintenance shop, sometimes in self-contained breathing apparatus because we find five gallons of ether hidden away in it. And while they're, we're there, we go over and say hi to the painters. And don't forget to check the backyard. Okay, so after we've done our tour, we know where the chemicals are, now we need to figure out how do we store all these chemicals safely. Well, there's four primary goals for chemical storage. Don't store what you're not going to use. Keep the container and contents from degrading. Keep your incompatible chemicals apart. And protect human health and the environment from spills, leaks, or just plain old knuckleheadedness. So let's go through these. So first off, only store and buy what you need. Don't fill your lab up with clutter and hide your chemicals in amongst it. So reduce that chemical clutter. And first thing is, ask some questions. Do you use this? If you don't use this, ask the other teachers around if they use it. If they don't, nobody's using it. Get it out of there. Much less chance of having problems with storage, say if an earthquake hits or something like that, if these hazardous chemicals that aren't being used aren't around. If they are using it, ask how much do you use? If you've got 17 pounds of lead nitrate, how much do you use? Typically it's a gram or two a year. 17 pounds, about a 2,000 year supply of this compound. Get rid of 16 of the pounds, keep one. Then of the stuff you've got, prioritize, of the stuff you've got that needs to be disposed, prioritize which one should go first, because it will be expensive. Remove the highest hazard compounds first. Eliminate the stuff that's useless. If you can, substitute safer compounds. Um, there is a tool that we can provide you to help assess the hazards versus the need. And if you contact me, I will be happy to send that off to you. I'll have my contact information at the end of the presentation. So let's get rid of the highest hazard stuff first. On the list that I can provide, these are what we call the risk factor four compounds. These are things that have multiple hazards. They're flammable and they're corrosive and they're toxic. They may be highly reactive. If you breathe them in, they could be poisonous or if you touch them. And they have very little utility for actually teaching. So they're not very useful and they're very hazardous. These are good candidates. So once you get an idea of what you want to dispose of, um, as far as the higher risk chemicals, how do you easily figure out um, which ones are going to go and which ones are going to stay? Because it's not like you're going to just go through and immediately start loading them up in the boxes if you want to be safe about this, because you want to keep incompatible chemicals apart. One simple way to do this is go through your shelves and the bottles on the right hand go and the bottles on the left hand stay. 
So shelf by shelf, look at the bottles. If you're not going to use them and nobody needs them, move them to the right side and leave the space in between. That way, when you finally do contact a hazardous waste disposal company, it's very easy for you to say, okay, we're going to go through, and the stuff on the right is the stuff that needs to go, and the stuff on the left is the stuff that we want to keep. Um, makes it much faster and simpler, and the faster they can identify what needs to go, the less money you have to pay them for standing around waiting for you to figure it out. The other thing you can do is check to see if other schools can use some of these chemicals that you don't need anymore within your district. Um, or even another classroom in your uh, school, maybe they need that lead nitrate that you don't need anymore. It's way cheaper to give it away to somebody who's actually going to use it than it is to pay for disposal. Another thing you can do is you can add a date sticker to track which chemicals you're using. If you're not sure, let's say you're a brand new teacher in a, in coming in, you haven't quite got the curriculum together yet, you can print out a whole bunch of stickers through any kind of a printer and put just the date that you're going to put the stickers on the bottles uh, on those stickers. So maybe the year 2007 or the year 2008. Pull a sticker off and connect it between the cap and the side of the bottle. And then when you go and open that bottle, take the sticker off and throw it away. Five years later, check to see how many of those stickers are still on the bottles. If you see stickers on 80% of the bottles in your stock room, 80% of those bottles are not being used in a five-year period and could probably go. It's a good visual way to get an idea of how much of this stuff is actually not needed. I think most people assume that just because it's on the shelf, somebody probably could use it. My experience, 70% uh, of the chemicals that are on shelves in stock rooms aren't being used, haven't been used in 30 years, and aren't going to be used ever. But there's this thing of not throwing away something that may be useful, and you really need to get over that. So let's say you've gone through and you've thinned out your shelves and gotten rid of the stuff you don't need, which is a great first step because it makes it way easier to safely store what you've got left. Now you go back in and assess what's left. Check the container condition and the condition of the contents. Check the condition of the shelves that you've got in the cabinets to make sure they're not falling apart from these old crappy chemicals that you had that were sitting around before. So one of the things you want to do is keep your containers and contents from degrading. You need to understand that some containers are much more prone to problems than others. Bottles that have metal caps, caps tend to corrode. Metal cans that have liquids in them are going to probably corrode. Eyedroppers tend to corrode. Some of the chemicals that tend to degrade, metal chlorides, tin chloride, zinc chloride, they tend to pull water from the air. They're hygroscopic. They're going to get wet. They may say zinc chloride crystals on the side, but when I pick it up, it may look like a puddle of zinc chloride on the inside. Things that are light reactive, like the silver compounds, if they're in a clear glass bottle, they're going to degrade and no longer be useful over time. Check your containers every year. Look for degradation. Are they rusting? Are the caps getting cracked? Are the labels discolored? Crystals poking out? Are the droppers getting stiff? I go through and just pinch every eyedropper in a lab when I come in to see if they've hardened up. If it is degraded, either replace the container or replace the cap or else dispose of that stuff because it's not going to get used. Here's some photos of some degraded containers to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Hairline cracks, pooched in eyedroppers, um, rusted cans, crystals oozing out, rusted valves on uh, gas cylinders. Here's some example of degraded chemicals. So the container may be okay, but the chemical may be degraded. Um, water reactive compounds like calcium carbide start getting brown. That indicates they're reacting with the, with the moisture in the air. Peroxide compounds may be turning color, like this elemental potassium that's now orange. That's not potassium anymore. That's a bomb in a jar. And you want to check containers for signs that contents have degraded. Again, this is part of your storage pattern. If you've got things that are breaking down, you don't want them stored. Who cares about safely storing them? Get them out of here. So pooched out cans indicate gas buildup, like this miner's lamp, which is calcium carbide on the side. Um, liquids in bottles that originally held dry salts, crystals around caps. Storage cabinets that are degraded could indicate that you've got problems with the containers inside. And they're certainly not going to be good places to store your chemicals. So rusty shelves that are overloaded, very dangerous situation for storage. Metal acid cabinets should be replaced with coated wood acid cabinets. Um, metal is going to rust. This acid cabinet in the photo is five years old, and you can already see it's pretty well degraded. These things are $700 a pop. Buy one that's going to last a while. So use the non-metal ones. Uh, the Cymatco company is the one that I see in most schools. Theirs is epoxy-coated marine-grade plywood with plastic spill tray and plastic hinges. It will never corrode. 
So now you've got your nasty old stuff away, you've got your shelves in good shape. The next step is keep your incompatible chemicals apart. This is pretty straightforward. You keep your acids away from your bases, your oxidizers away from your flammables, and you be wary when you see this kind of situation when people have been moving their chemicals. It's like, hmm, a box full of chemicals. Very good chance that you've got incompatible chemicals in a box. Anything that looks really disorganized is probably really disorganized. In a case like this picture where you've got a box full of them, if somebody adds one more bottle in there and drops it, could break a cap, break a bottle, and start a chain reaction in there that you're not going to be prepared to, to uh, deal with. So here's a photo of a typical stock room that's grossly overstuffed. Is this segregated storage? Well, no. Um, you've got so many chemicals in there that there's no way that you can separate them by enough distance to have them not run the risk of coming in contact in case of an earthquake or even somebody just grabbing one bottle and trying to move it out of there without bonking into other bottles. One of the most common incompatibilities we see is in the acid cabinet with nitric acid and glacial acetic acid stored together. Nitric acid is a powerful oxidizer. Glacial acetic acid is combustible. Oxidizers set combustible liquids on fire. Flaming acid in your acid storage cabinet, not a good thing. Bleach and ammonia stored together. This could be in the kitchen in your school. You mix bleach and ammonia, you get chloramine gas, highly poisonous. Beautiful blue color, but if you breathe it in, it could kill you. Very common uh, incompatible storage situation. So one of the things you can do in, in terms of your storage is make sure that things are stored in such a way that it reduces the risk of there being a spill just because of the way things are stored. And it also reduces the risk that you're going to have somebody come in it could be a student, it could be somebody else who thinks they know about chemicals, but really turns out to be kind of a knucklehead. So don't store your chemicals near drains. It's just inviting the chance that the bottle's going to tip over, and before you can do anything about it, it breaks and it's right down the drain. And now how do you get it out? The other risk is that there'll be another spill, and the liquid that you spilled the first time is still sitting in the pee trap underneath your sink, and the next liquid you pour in could be incompatible, which could create a real highly hazardous uh, vapor rocketing back out right into your face. So keep your hazardous chemicals out of the drains. The best way to do that, don't store them near them. Use secondary containment. The containment should hold 110% of the largest container that's stored in it. So if you've got a one gallon container, the container tray should store at least a gallon and a half to make sure in case it tips over and all of it empties out, it can't get out. Plastic trays are by far the best. In the picture here, you can see that they've got them segregated by the different types of hazards. These are the common chemical solutions that they're using. If a bottle tips over, it's not going to get off the counter, down on the floor, where somebody could step in it or come in contact with it. And you'll have a very good chance of knowing what spilled because the bottle is in the same containment as the spilled liquid. And then for Pete's sake, use proper labels for chemicals. So if you see something like 5% water with the skull and crossbones, you don't have to think, hmm, I wonder what the other 95% is. It can't be water, and what's with the skull and crossbones? What hazards should I be concerned about here? If this stuff spilled, you wouldn't have the faintest idea of what to do. And methyl something, well, it's probably organic, but do you have a material safety data sheet for it that would tell you what the hazards are? And they didn't even spell methyl right. So instead of saying don't smell, say hydrochloric acid, corrosive. It has the name of the compound that matches the material safety data sheet that you have for all of your chemicals, right? And it has the primary hazard associated with it. So anybody could come up and if they saw the stuff spilled on the floor and they saw that label, they would go, oh, it's an acid, it's corrosive, don't touch. Whereas if you're a chemist and you see a label that says don't smell, the first thing you're going to say is, hmm, I wonder what's in here. The way chemists usually figure it out is they take the top off and they smell it. It's a horrible quandary to be in if you see this. So this is the primary risk, essentially, is that your chemicals are unknown, so you don't know how to store them safely, or your chemicals are so hazardous that even if you store them safely as far as being near or away from incompatible compounds, they're so hazardous that you can't really touch them safely anyways. What you want to have is the chemicals on your shelf are generally safe. The hazards they pose are ones that are fairly easy to control. So if it's a lead compound, don't swallow it. Well, that's pretty easy to control in a lab. If it's something we're just looking at it funny, could be enough to cause it to detonate because you touched the bottle, not, not a safe way to store that compound. 
one of the places you can go to get excellent information on safe storage is the Flynn Scientific Catalog, which most schools use for ordering their chemicals. Uh, Flynn would be very happy to provide you with a free catalog, and their storage system is one of the best around. Um, you can also get information directly from me on how to safely store chemicals if you have a smaller stock room. The Flynn system is designed for larger stock rooms. For small stock rooms, I developed a very simple system that's very easy to use. You can contact me, Dave Waddell, at King County Hazardous Waste Management at dave.waddell at kingcounty.gov, and I'd be happy to email you that shelf storage system. Thanks.